One of the most persistent questions that I have received over the last decade living in the US has been, how did you get your scholarship to study at the number one public university in the world, knowing that you come from such economically challenged background? And today, I will attempt to answer that question. You see, when I was 20, I had just graduated high school. And upon graduation, I was not sure what to do. I come from a family where my mom has a third grade education. When she was going to school, but in her days, the relatives in my community, they came and they, they, they snatched her from school. They would ask, why does a woman need to go to school? How does it impact her ability to be a mother? How is it gonna make her a better homemaker? So they did not allow my mom to go to school. And my dad, he attained a sixth grade education. And upon attaining that sixth grade education, he made up his mind that any of his eight children that wanted to go to school, they had to figure it out themselves. So in my family of eight, only one person had attended college. And now I was attempting to attend college myself. So I was at this crossroad. I've just attended 12th grade education. And everybody that knew me, they were like, hey, listen, you have done more than most. You have a 12th grade education. Most of the people in Nigeria, they cannot read. They cannot spell their names. In fact, some of the schools that I went to as a kid, our teachers, they could not speak English. An English teacher unable to write their name in English trying to teach you. It was very, very interesting. But I was determined. I knew, I believed in Nelson Mandela's quote that education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. I believed it in my heart that there is a transformative power in education. After sitting around, after wondering, after deliberating, after having relatives tell me, listen, you've attained a 12th grade education. Go become a roadside mechanic. Go become a carpenter. Go find, go learn a skill, go find a trade. At that moment, I realized that their vision for my life is not my vision for my life. It's like Steve Jobs said, do not let the loud noise of other people drown out your inner voice. And my inner voice was telling me that I needed to attend tertiary education. I needed to attend a university. Upon deliberating, upon finding an avenue to attend this goal, I decided to take our entrance examination called the Joint Admission and Matriculation Board, our version of the SAT. Upon taking this exam, I was told by the admissions office that, hey, listen, you are smart. You have taken, you've taken this exam and you have, you've gotten all the credentials. You are very eligible to, to, to be admitted into this university in Nigeria. But they told me that in order to secure my spot, that I needed to pay a bribe of 100,000 Naira. At this point, I barely had money to eat. I was practically homeless. I was jumping from couch to couch. In fact, when I, was, when I would visit my friends and relatives, I would time when they were going to eat dinner. If their dinner time is 7 p.m., I will arrive by 6.45, just to make sure that I get that all-important invitation to, to eat. At this point, I had no bank account. I barely had anything to eat throughout the day. I was just bouncing around, hoping that I can get this admission. But once they told me that I needed to pay that bribe, I knew that it was time to pivot. And in my attempt to pivot, the admissions, it, went, it, it, it fell through the first year. In the second year of attempting to retake this exam, 
Because sometimes people in Nigeria, young people, eligible young people that should be in university, they are not able to gain admission. They are not able to secure an admission. There is, there's an admission space for 400 people, 400,000 people, yet there are, there, there are two million applicants trying to, trying to gain admission. So there's a very high supply, a very high demand, a very low supply. So the admission spaces, they are very, very coveted. After I realized that that was not gonna work the first year, the second year while attempting to reapply for admission, I came across this quote by Ellen Johnson Salif, the first female president in Africa, the president of Liberia, and she said, if your dreams do not scare you, your dreams are not big enough. That quote, those 12 words, they will become some of the most profound words I ever heard in my life. They will revolutionize my thinking. They will make a paradigm shift so, so significant. I thought, so what if I actually am not thinking big enough? What if I'm not dreaming big enough? And in that moment of debating and deliberating, I decided that what if I could actually study abroad? It sounded so crazy at the time. What if I could actually gain a scholarship to study abroad? That mere thought, it would have me almost shivering because at this point, I had never been to an airport. I had never seen an airplane. As kids, I would be standing, I would look at airplanes in the sky, and I would think one day, one day, I'm going to be in that big box flying in the sky. The concept of an airplane always fascinated me. But I had never, I didn't even know anyone that had ever been abroad. But I thought, what if it were possible to get a scholarship and study abroad? And the, 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 the crazy things about dreams that seem so crazy is that they, 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 they seem impossible even to ourselves. And after I said, what if I could study abroad on scholarship? I laughed nervously to myself and told myself to put down that imaginary weed because how do you just wake up one morning and decide that you want to study abroad? I told the people closest to me, I told family and friends, I told them that I have this dream, it, 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 it's kind of scary, I have this dream that I want to study abroad on scholarship. And one of my relatives, he said, yeah, come on man, everyone would love to study abroad on scholarship, be realistic. I told another friend, that hey, I think I would like to study, I would really, really love to study abroad. And he said, Michael, you're smart, but you're not that smart. Be realistic. And then I realized one thing, that dreams are like ships. Dreams, they are like ships. They do not sink because of the water around them. Dreams, they sink because of the water that gets in them. And so I decided that with the doubt, with the self-doubt, with the naysayers around me, I was going to pursue this dream. And then immediately, through causes of miracles, I started doing my research. I found out that I needed $500 to kickstart this process. Like a maniac, I went out, started looking for jobs. And then the universe has a way of conspiring with you when you know what you want. Serendipitously, I found a job at a, at a hotel. And in that job, I was gonna be a housekeeper and a janitor. In that job, I was working 12 hours a day, six days a week. And it was a monthly pay of $100. After working six months, I was able to save up. They needed $500 because the breakdown of that $500 was that I needed to register for the SAT, which I had no idea what it was after graduating high school. I needed to invest in professional coaching 
to help me improve my odds of success because I knew that to get something I have not gotten, I must do something I have not done before. And I also, re I also realized that I needed an international passport. Like I said, I have never ever had a need for passport. Where the hell am I going? And so after raising this $500, I quit that job, went all in, and started learning about the application process. The process to go from not knowing anything about studying abroad and getting a scholarship abroad. And so in this, in this, in this process, I started learning about application essays, how to write application essays that would keep admissions officers up at night. I started learning about getting recommendation letters because if you were going to school in Nigeria, you did not need that. I started learning about ordering for transcript because again, these are not requirements for schools in Nigeria. After putting all this together and making a list of schools and researching schools in the US, in Canada, in Lebanon, in Germany, I, I came across this college that really stood out to me. It was the University of California in Berkeley. And I was just so enamored by the vastness of the wealth and resources and history and their activism and everything that it represented. It just, it just, it, it drew me in. Berkeley became my dream school. I told my advisor that I, I, I think I want to apply to Berkeley. And she said, come on now, let's be realistic. Why? Why, why would you want to do that to yourself? Berkeley is so up there. Let's look at somewhere like Arizona State. No shade to them. <laughs> Let's look at somewhere with 80% acceptance rate. Not somewhere with, come on, be realistic, she told me. But I knew again, ships, they do not sink because of the water around them. They sink because of the water that gets in them. Relentlessly, I put together my application, I applied, and after applying, because I had such, we had such limited access to the internet, I would go to cyber cafes, and in those cyber cafes, you would pay like 100 naira, and then you would have 30 minutes to browse the internet. And I would Google photos of UC Berkeley, and in the night, after studying for SAT with my kerosene lamp, I would start visualizing myself walking on the campus of UC Berkeley, talking to UC Berkeley students, interacting and debating with professors, just, just generating that feeling like I was there, even though I was in an uncompleted building that had no light, had no power supply, we, 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 we used candlelights and kerosene lamp. I would take my mind mentally to UC Berkeley and see myself walking through Cedar Gate. After 18 months of writing essays and rewriting them, making lists of schools and, and, and remaking those lists, I finally got that email that would change everything. It would revolutionize my life. It would change the life of everyone that knew me. I got that email that said, congratulations. I am pleased to announce to you that you have been accepted into the University of California at Berkeley, and it further read that we are doubly pleased to, to announce to you that you have been awarded the MasterCard Foundation Scholarship Program at University of California in Berkeley. Now the MasterCard Foundation Scholarship, it seeks to train young people, the young, the, 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 the next transformative leaders for Africa. It seeks to train people that would give back to their communities that have strong ethos of giving back. Upon receiving this scholarship, I came to the US and one of the first things I noticed was that I had an accent. Well, the thing about accent is that everyone has an accent depending on where you are. But the debilitating thing I didn't know back then was that this accent began to make me feel very self-conscious so much so that I would become very hesitant in contributing in classes. But upon trying to overcome this 
this barrier, I realized that accents, they are not a measure of intelligence. It's just a way of conveying words. And also, while at the University of California, I realized that I started to struggle with a sense of belonging. I would think like, these people, they are all so, so freaking smart. How did I end up here? I mean, I'm from rural Africa where I was going to the stream to fetch water that would we use. I had, first time I saw a shower, I was so amazed. I was like, you can just turn a knob and have water pour from the sky. Up to that point, we'll go to the stream and it was different. And so dealing with that imposter syndrome, I went to the admissions office to ask them if they really, really, really wanted to admit Michael Omeka, if they did not mean to give my admission to someone else. Turns out they actually wanted to admit me. And also, like, whilst trying to, to understand this imposter syndrome, I read about the life of Albert Einstein, arguably one of the smartest people to ever walk the earth. And in his, in his biography, it was stated that he suffered from imposter syndrome. Albert Einstein used to feel like a fraud. And then it, it dawned on me that the feeling of self-doubt, the feeling of not feeling enough, the feeling of holding ourselves back, we all have these feelings. Olympians, CEOs, Nobel laureates, we all deal with self-doubt. But the distinguishing factor is that we cannot let it stop us. Self-doubt is not an impediment to action if we don't let it. And dealing with other international students, I realized that, that we also struggled with the sense of belonging that I am not Nigerian enough for Nigerian anymore because I have been Americanized, AKA corrupted. And I am not American enough for America because, well, I'm not from around here. So I'm neither here nor there. But the flip happened when I realized that that could become a superpower, that it is an in-between advantage, having a very contextual understanding of a different world and having profound understanding of another world because you are seeing the best of both worlds. And once I made this shift, once I made this realization, I felt empowered, I felt that my dreams, my goals, they were achievable. And that if I don't try to stop me, nothing can stop me. Because again, ships do not sink because of the water around them. Ships sink because of the water that gets in them. And my wish is that we will not let water that we do not want get in us and weigh us down. And my last injunction in this talk is that this idea of empowering young people, of helping other people understand that their situation is it's not so removed, that we are all interconnected, that your struggle, I also feel it. My struggle, you also could relate to it. And I hope that this is an idea worth sharing. Thank you. <laughs>